This is Richard Corbett from Newton Ards in Northern Ireland, and you're listening to The Canted Frame. Many of you know Karen Hutton in her role as a landscape and travel photographer, as well as an educator, an author, and even a voice artist. But along with her exceptional body of work, she brings to it all an appreciation for what makes photography such a unique and special creative practice. She describes it as all, an instance of wonder that is more about the moment of revelation than just the click of a shutter. But Karen also recognizes that there is a lot of hard work behind creating the circumstances for such magic moments to occur. It can often demand that you push yourself beyond what you thought you were capable of. There's a, an adventure climbing, an adventure hiking, an adventure adventuring. There's the thing where you push yourself past the point you think you can do something, like it's a harder climb or a longer hike, and you think you can't do it, and then you get to the other side, and the, you know, the choir of angel feeling <laughs> that you get at the end it's like it elevates you. It takes you a whole new place and it shifts you. I call it awe. It's a, like a moment of awe. And I knew that I just had to slog until it was done because I knew what, what I would have at the other end was some freedom. Karen understands that the creative process, if it's going to mean anything, will demand moving beyond the status quo, which can be terrifying and confusing, but also liberating and joyful. But such moments always arrive at a critical time when you can either decide to stop or press on. So, but when I start feeling crappy, I don't want to say, I want to say I welcome it. Not because I like to feel that way, but because I know, okay, I'm in a growth spurt here. And if I can sit with this and I can breathe through this, like I'm facing a couple things right now, where I'm like, you know, I just want to quit at, I don't know how to do that. And I'm like, really, really, really? That's the best you got? Come on. <laughs> so I kind of welcome the issue part because I know that that's doing, that's part of doing the work. And that is the part of doing the work that is my own personal breakthrough that's going to allow everything else to happen that I want. And if I'm not willing to go through that, then I can't, you know, fine, you don't have to, you won't get to have all that that juice at the other end. I've done both. And I much prefer the reality selection that happens after going through that than staying comfortable all the time. We'll talk to Karen about how simplifying her living situation transformed her life and why an ice skater's single performance often brings her to tears. This is Ibadi and X, and welcome back to The Candid Frame. So how have you been? Good. Stinking. I mean, God, what a busy year. This is my year to try stuff. And I tried a lot of stuff and did a lot of stuff. And I mean, it's just been nonstop. Really? Yeah. And too much, way too much, but good in the sense of, you know, I, now I know what I want to do more of and less of. And now I'm making oh, my plans good. for next year. Yeah. Good, it's been good. very, very defining in many ways. Well, that's kind of what I want to talk with you about, because I, I, I really so much enjoyed our first conversation. You know, I've been keeping up with you and some of the interesting things you've been doing creatively, but just personally as well. Uh -huh. And uh, I just felt like, well, <laughs> it's time for, me, for him, her and me to just chat and just talk about I life know. and process and we'll get photography <laughs> in there. But I think... It's, yeah. There are certain yeah. people that I just enjoy having those kinds of conversations with, and you mm -hmm. are certainly one of them, because I think that um, I think we're cut from the same cloth. Ditto. Yeah. I know, and there's not that many of us, and that's why when you, when you pinged me, I was like, yay, we get yeah. to do that thing. I love that. So thank you. There's just a lot of stuff going on in my life, uh, uh, too, and I was talking to a friend of mine the other day. We were both talking about the idea of, isn't it nice to not give a blank anymore. Right? Give a blank? Give a what blank. F word where the blank is. Oh, oh, give an effing, <laughs> an effing blank? You yeah. Mean? yeah. You give a blank anymore about right? all the things that we did when we were younger. And I went, 
You know, that's really true. And that's especially true when it comes to my creativity. Yep. You know, I, and I, you've kind of talked along those lines in, in your presentations and about learning to discern between the voices, right? The voices wow, does the, that ever take a yeah? Does that ever take a lifetime? Yeah. Holy cow! Because I have I, a lot of voices, and some of them are really strong. Oh yeah. And some of them are really strong and wrong. Yeah, and and, and mine are heavily accented. Are they? <laughs> what do they sound like? Oh, you know, they have a Spanish accent, Dominican accent. They sometimes speak to me in Spanish. That's my heritage. So that that wow. sort of. Wow! I don't have that. That's cool. I want to borrow one of yours. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> no. <laughs> I had a, I had a business coach once that said the mind is a dangerous place to go alone. <laughs> oh my God, that is so true. That Isn't is so it? true. Yeah, but I I, but I, I I think it's been really sort of interesting, and I, this is one I wanted to sort of talk to to you about this whole idea of as photographers. You experience a lot with teaching your students. There's such a fixation on the uh, equipment and the technique, you know. But there comes a time where where you have to give yourself permission to make mistakes. Be a fool, you know, fall <laughs> flat on your face and do it. And it's, and it can be really, really hard. And I think we all kind of go through phases of this, mm -hmm. but that's what I want to talk to you about. Cause I think you've had different moments in your life. Like when you had that dental issue that almost took you out and mm -hmm. all that other stuff, but you know, it's, it's been a while since then. So yeah. I, I'm, I'm wondering about, you know, how that experience has sort of re re revisited you more recently mm -hmm. and how you oh, kind yeah. of and how you kind of figured out oh wait I don't want to go down that path again and I want right. to maintain the sort of the truth of who I am so that's sort of a long-winded way of being able to tell you that what, what I want to talk to you about but just yeah what, what do you think about that yeah perfect and you know there's another thing too I've had conversations I don't know we can throw this into the mix not belabor it but a friend is, he does photography. He's not a photographer per se. He's mm -hmm. kind of more of an entrepreneur, but a really mm -hmm. good thinker. And we've had these conversations about doing the work. Yeah. And I mean, back in my acting days, that's all we ever talked about. It's like we were in service of the work and like it was work to get good at your craft. We always talked about it as a craft and there was um, a certain reverence for that whole process. And in photography, it's like now the conversation is starting to be more about, you know, it's not about the settings and this and that. And I'm like, well, okay. So now the, I feel like the conversation is starting to swing the other way a little mm -hmm. bit. And it's good because I've always wanted to be able to say, look, you know how important the settings are? It's about doing the work. If you don't have the skills, you can't just, you know. Right. So if you, if you don't know how to put your settings where you need them without looking at your camera, then get in the, go in the backyard or your rumpus room or whatever and drill yourself, make up exercises, make up drills and get really, really good at it so that it's secondary and do the work, you know, because it's a discipline just like anything else. And I'm telling you, I've done everything I've done has been a huge discipline. It was a lot of work and I did the work and I got good at it. Then I got free. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's that's so important. Because, mm -hmm. And there's no there's no shortcut to getting no. there. You know? No, there's not. You got it. You got to work your ass off. And that's not it's see that mindset sits in a space, I think, sort of in between, you know, what settings are you using and that whole conversation that we all got so sick of. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what do you love and follow your heart and all that kind of stuff. This sits right, I think, in between because. I'm like, and now I see the conversation going from, oh, don't worry about your settings, just do what you love. And I'm like, yeah, but there's a section right yeah. here where you got to freaking work. And I think that one of the obstacles that to putting in the work is being burdened by expectation. Mm -hmm. Because work is mm -hmm. not about immediate satisfaction. It's not about seeing, you know, trying a new technique, buying a new piece of equipment, and immediately seeing the results. That's not the way it works. And you that's have one of to, the challenges of, of, you know, the expectation in downhill skiing or painting or singing or mm -hmm. acting is that you're going to be at it for years. Photography is so instant, then you start thinking that that expertise and that mastery is instant. We live in a culture where it's all about immediate gratification. You want to yeah. feel good, go buy something. You want to feel good, eat that decadent dessert. <laughs> I do know? that. I do both of those things. <laughs> 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 and you know what? It kind of works for a while. Yeah, but but not for photography, at least for, a, no. you know, you get that rush of that new piece of, of gear and you're playing with it and you feel like, God, I'm a photographer. And then, yeah. you know, take the I pictures bet. and, oh, they're the same like my other camera and the camera before that. Nothing's changed. Yeah. And then you go... Right. And then you crash. But right. I think that for me, it's just about the, the, the changes, the evolution are so incremental 
but it's that daily grind of constantly yeah. practicing seeing and working where you'll have a moment when you least expect it when that you'll realize that something's happened. Right. And it's right. never sort of a purposeful thing about going, okay, I'm going to go from point A to point B. No, it's because you were doing some work and all of a sudden you look at it, take a step back and you realize, oh, something different happened. Yeah, and that's that moment of awe. Y- even if it's small, it is kind of like I talk about awe a lot because it's so mm-hmm. transformative. Because when you have that moment where you go, something has changed, you kind of get goosebumps, you get a little excited. And that's awe, even if it's small. And that shifts you because then that sets you up for your next thing it's no longer the same grind now your world has shifted and that's the reward that i go for that allows me to keep pressing on to do the work not because i set some grand goal for myself but those small moments that are so rich with satisfaction and joy those are the things that sort of sustain you doing the work over the long term right right Right. And I mean, I even had that recently. I don't know if you want to throw this in. Some of the directions I want to take next have Mm -hmm. to do with fine art and have to do with a slightly, not a hugely, vastly different way of photographing, but a a little different slant. And and it involves medium format. So I had my GFX on my recent road trip and I went and photographed that way. And and they weren't all successful, um, but the ones that were, I just went, (gasps) oh. Oh my God, there it is. There it is. I knew it was there and it isn't everything. And, you know, it's, 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 I'm calling it baby steps in that direction, even though they're, they're, they're really, they're good, Mm -hmm. but I see where they can improve, but it's exciting because I'm like, there it is. That's, I'm seeing what it is I'm feeling now. Well, you've always been about that, about, about, you know, tying in the feeling with the experience. I mean, because that's your touchstone. How else are you going to know if you've nailed it? Or if you're mm-hmm. even headed a direction you want to go, or you're not just following somebody else's instruction or somebody else's path. A lot of times you don't know that. I was talking to a friend of mine. Uh, he's, a, he's a musician. He's a composer. He's a producer. Mm-hmm. And I was talking to him a couple of years ago. He was um, uh, playing on the, touring, on the touring band for a major musical performer, mm-hmm. right? So he was be on tour with her throughout the country when she went abroad. And for the longest time, he had been wanting to leave there, leave her in order to, you know, dedicate more stuff to what he wanted to do. And I remember him talking about that, him being very nervous because he relied a lot in terms of income on that and he wasn't sure what he was going to do. And I just talked to him the other day and it's like three years now and he's been working, not only has he released an album, but he's also... Uh, been working as a producer from for some huge names whose names you would easily recognize and and it's like and i and i talked to him and i made the point you know sometimes you gotta let stuff go in order for you to be able to embrace something else and sometimes it's hard scary to lift oh yeah it'll push you and it'll push you personally and make you develop yourself and i know one of the things i'm doing is completely changing my recording studio because Partly because we moved here last year and the studio isn't, you know, we really built out the room up the mountain and um, and it was soundproof and everything. And mm-hmm. this is sound treated. It's not soundproof, but it's a quiet neighborhood. So, you know, things are kind of, but it's not 100%. So the mic, so my Neumann U89i, which is an incredible mic, but that requires, you know, this... Um, this preamp and the sound conditioner and this and that and the other thing. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of space and in the audio is it my voice sounds good, but the room doesn't sound as good. And it's, it's kind of bugging me. And I want to be on the road more in my trailer or just traveling, period. Mm-hmm. And it's not a traveling mic at all. So I'm like, all right, well, so now I've, I it just arrived yesterday, a Sennheiser 416. We've got mm-hmm. an Apollo Twin. So between the sen- the 416, this Apollo Twin, and my little MacBook Air, which is not really good for anything except this, that's it. And the shotgun mic is so directional that I will be able to take it in the trailer and have a setup there and a setup here, totally redesigning the studio after 25 years, I think. Yeah. It's freakish, but it's needed and it's necessary for where I want to go next because I turn down voiceover gigs and auditions all the time when I'm out traveling. And this way I won't have to, which is going to make up, make up some of the difference in the income is yeah. where I was headed with that. Well, you simplified your life a bit over the last year, two years, right? Yeah. So t- t- yeah, t- yeah. T- tell me about why you felt the need to be able to do that and, and what that did for you photographically. So my husband works out of town. He has for the last 15 years, works in the Bay Area. I live up in the mountains, the Sierra Nevada mountains. So he's going to be retiring next year. 
So we just wanted, you know, it wasn't like, oh, we have to downscale because we're retiring. Mm -hmm. It was downscaling for sure, but it's because of what we want to do next, which is, you know, me expanding my business, traveling more, getting in on the road. So I don't want to be cleaning house. I don't want to be looking after, a you know, a big, beautiful house. Yeah. <laughs> So we moved to a much smaller house. I think we dropped almost a thousand square feet, got rid of, you know, just anything we didn't, that we didn't love, we got rid of. I think we got rid of about 90% of our belongings, period. Wow. Yeah. And I'm not saying we don't have a lot of stuff because we still have stuff. I mean, I still have my clothes and, you know, we got some, we bought new furniture, but just select pieces of what we know now that we will use, mm -hmm. that we love, that we, that, you know, improve our life and even still it feels like wow now that we've been through that we could actually downsize more if we wanted to but I don't want to spend the time on it um, <laughs> and I changed my focus you know to really uh, what's the word um, embrace I guess photography in a new way and inc incredible opportunities came my way this year and they were all quality opportunities they were all incredible and after the move, so this all relates, after the move, I went into this big funk because so much of my identity was tied into living in Tahoe, mm -hmm. living in Truckee. I look at the sky and I know what's going to happen either in, over at the lake in Tahoe or out in my neck of the woods because there's a, a small mountain range in between. When the roads closed, I was trapped in, not shut out. Now I'm shut out. And again, the roads close often because there's more and more Bay Area people and they can't drive in the snow. And so they, they close the roads for us. Thank you, people. So that, plus every day I don't look out at a horizon to horizon sky with these beautiful clouds and all this stuff. And, you know, it's, I love where we live. I love our home, but um, it's trees, a lot of trees. Can't always see the sky. So, and then it's now I live in a desert and not in the mountains, and I love the mountains. So I did it knowing that I wanted to encourage myself to get out because I can't just shoot Lake Tahoe and where I live in the Sierras for the rest of my life. It just, for me, it gets boring, and it's not expansive enough for me. So there I was. I, I, you know, I did everything I said I was going to do, and I got really depressed because I was in grief over leaving the mountains. Mm -hmm. I was trying to figure out this new home, which was much smaller, and we, we remodeled it completely. Um, so it was totally awesome. I lived in my trailer for four months um, while we were doing that. So I got familiar with the trailer, but I felt sort of homeless at the same time. And so pretty much everything, because I used to be just slightly agoraphobic. Like it was, I used to panic out of these panic attacks before a trip. I still get them a little bit. I just sort of no, I'm going to feel that way and mm -hmm. go, oh, you're doing that thing. Okay, fine. You'll feel good when you get out there. Yeah. And I do. But here it was every day. So I had to deal, I had to let myself have this grief. I'd be walking down the hallway and just burst into tears. Like I'd just be sobbing for like three minutes mm -hmm. and then it'd be done. And just, I couldn't say I hated my life or anything because here we just made this big change. But it was, it was so big that it just, it rocked me. So I simplified it, <laughs> but it didn't, you know, magic always comes with a price. So Ooh, I, I like that. Yeah. yeah. And so the, for the magic was I had to let go of a lot really fast and it rocked me because when I say I was a little bit agoraphobic, what I learned to do was to ground myself through my stuff Explain. and we let go of a lot of stuff. Explain that. Yeah. I mean, there's an element of, of, a good it's a good thing so like for instance people who go totally mobile like they don't have a home they give up their home and they're just mobile right. they always have a few things maybe it's a candle maybe it's a little book maybe it's a photo maybe it's a favorite pair of pants or whatever that wherever they go in the world as they're completely mobile they have these things and they set them up on their nightstand or they set them up on their whatever and that's their touchstone right so i had that but i needed it to, <laughs> you just needed more than a few things you throw in a bag. I needed a, I needed for my living space to be a certain way. And, and for some reason, I needed a lot of clothes, apparently, <laughs> because holy crap, did I get rid of a lot of clothes. I got rid of, okay, this is sad, but it's true. I had so many pants because my weight has changed a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I had so many, and, and you don't look good in jeans 
at every weight in you know in every style and right. not all the styles stay in style so you grab the ones that look good at all these different weights and you save them oh, yeah so i decided i finally figured out what was causing some of this weight swing and everything seemed to be stable so i was like okay letting go letting go so i filled this giant black garbage bag full of the pants i wanted the jeans just the jeans I'm not talking about anything else okay the jeans i couldn't lift it Literally couldn't lift it. Had to divide it in half and make it two bags. And I'm like, "What the heck? <laughs> what? Who are you?" And that's kind of what the pictures, the photos, the you know, the little print photos that I kept over the years. Same thing. Same thing. That's and then, a, so yeah. it's shocking. And but you encounter yourself in a whole new way because there's parts of yourself you squirreled away in your stuff that and then forgot about that you encounter when you're giving up all this stuff. Mm. So you're reclaiming parts of yourself. You're giving up parts of yourself that you no longer need, and it's mind-boggling. That's quite the metaphor for up here in the head. Yeah. That is a perfect metaphor, because when you gather all that stuff, you realize how much you've been carrying around. Right, and how much of yourself you left in your stuff. Mm. So consequently, when you say, I simplified my life, I did. (laughs) But I landed here going, who am I now? (laughs) I mean, I knew who I was, but at the same time... The day to day, I'm like, um. But that is such a good place to be. I mean, you kind of realize it in retrospect, but but it it is. But I've experienced that many many a time, where all of a sudden I'm at a complete loss in terms of who and what I am and what I'm doing, and that grief, that mourning period, and the the desire is to numb that feeling and to run back. Yeah. But you have to really make it okay because. Um, over the well, you've line. got to let the grief move. It, you can't let it lock up in your body somewhere. You've got to let it flow. You've got to let it move. And you've got to you know, get stuck on it and, and perpetuate it. But you need to let it happen because it's, it's part of the growth process. Everybody's like, oh, it's so wonderful. And I'm like, yeah, except for the part where I wanted to throw up because I was in so much grief. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> Anytime that I've experienced grief over the last I say, 10 years, I've made a mental note to myself, just sit in it. Yeah. You know, just, just, just feel it. Think yeah. about it. And, and it's been really interesting, even if I'm in the midst of, you know, sobbing on the floor, mm-hmm. it's like I'm... I'm, I'm just choosing to be conscious of the fact that I'm in it, that this is okay, yeah. and that it's not permanent. Right. And that, and being able to sort of embrace that degree of pain is so liberating just living a life as a human being, but right. also as an artist, because there are yeah. many times where I get frustrated, where I just get disappointed, and I feel like I can move through this. Because I know it's it's transitory. Yeah. And so as I make photographs and I'm taking risk and I know that some people are going to take a look at this work and say, I don't know what the hell you're doing. This sucks. I'm completely okay with it because I know in the direction in which I'm moving, moving and that all these pictures are working towards that. Yeah. And just because I choose to share it doesn't mean that I'm that these images are representative of who I am. And I think that that gives me the ability to not give an F. Yeah. You know, because I, I, I'm not placing my worth on the particular body of work I'm sharing at that moment. It's like, okay, right. this, this is just something as I'm walking along in my journey to get wherever I'm going to get to. Well, um, and I'm, yeah, exactly. And I'm fortunate in the sense that I've done, uh, I've worked to a high level in many different disciplines or a few, several, I don't know. <laughs> Some people say it's many. Some people say it's a few, whatever. Anyway, but <clears throat> all the artists that I know that were going through stuff in their life made art around it. So it wasn't all, you know, sunshine oh, yeah. and roses. For instance, um, when I was figure skating, Katerina uh, Gordieva was a pair. Well, she was, she was half of a pair, Russian pair skaters. They were, still are, the most amazing industry changing i mean like they were a pair of skaters that changed the sport and her husband and they were in their 20s and her husband you know was he was tall and strong and she was small and like and the lifts that they would do she'd soar and she was an incredible skater unto herself and he died he died suddenly of i forget if it was a heart or a brain thing in her arms on the ice like he literally was in the lift and he collapsed and he died in her arms on the ice at the height of their career. So 
you didn't hear from her for a while because you know you're paralyzed by that mm-hmm. and how what the, and they had a little girl so what do you do you know if she had to face all that luckily she is they were just the most wonderful humans so they had a lot of good friends so when she came back i can't even talk about it without crying because it's the most it was the most amazing performance when she came back and skated solo to him mm. And it killed us all. We we were all sobbing when we watched it. And I still do every time I think about it. Because she held nothing back. And she skated the skate of her life in honor of her husband. And, you know, I've seen this in many arts. I use that one as an example because it was so dramatic and it was so moving. But if you're going to really be an artist, that's what you got to do. you got to show up and inhabit your skin and inhabit the life that you've got. And hold nothing back. And she didn't. Yeah. And she was better for it. All of us were destroyed watching it. And yet at the same time, filled with hope. And we knew we witnessed something that none of us had really ever seen before. By her doing that, we were all changed. Yeah. You know, and that's what artists do. They change things. That's what they're supposed to do. Inform us and change us and make us feel things that we'd maybe rather not. Mm-hmm. or that elevate us or that elevate us even as we cry and feel grief about it, you know, 10 years later. <laughs> so I didn't think of that before, but, you know, so in every art form and discipline I've been in, I've seen this and yeah. it's incredible. And that's, and I think that's why I appreciate you and your work because you put yourself into your work that I don't look at that. I don't look at your work and say, oh, well, how, how nicely accomplished is it in terms of her technique and her use of light? And so if I take a look at those pictures, and I just settle into them. And I've seen, I see a lot of work, especially when I was an outdoor photographer. I'd see a lot of travel and nature work. And I would look at it, and i go, oh, it's really wonderful in terms of how well it's crafted. But I look at your mm-hmm. work, and maybe because it's partly because I know you a bit, I can take a look at those pictures, and I can feel like mm-hmm. you are inviting me to share it with you as if I was standing right next to you. And, 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 and what I love about you on top of all that is that when you do share and you do teach, you are so encouraging about people trusting their own voice, right? About yeah. that, that I want, you, and I want this for my own students. It's like you have something worthwhile to say, mm-hmm. that your existence on this life is unique and special. You using your camera is the means by which you can sort of celebrate that, not just for other people, but for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the ways that you honor the gift that you've been given. And I think it, 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 it's, it's, it may be the hardest thing for any artist to do, but Mm -hmm. when you see people, like you just mentioned the ice skater here, when you see musicians, athletes who give it their all and you just go and it just, it's inspiring, but I think it also reaffirms that part of ourselves that recognizes that. I think yep. is one of the reasons why that touched you so much because you recognize a part of your own truth in what she was doing. Right. And the realization that, you know, you and I have had conversations about doing the work, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And she had certainly, you know, done the work to become such a, an incredible artist and athlete, But she did the next level of work. She didn't give up. She created, out of her grief, a celebration of life, an affirmation of love, and gave it to all of us. And, And for me, I was like, I need for my life to be nothing less than that ever. Thanks for all your encouragement and patience as we work towards getting everything back in order here at the show. Your messages of understanding and encouragement mean so much. Along with hopefully having resolved some of the technical issues, we are finalizing our schedule for interviews leading up to episode 500. People have been asking me what I intend to do for it, and I'll just say that I think you'll be very pleased with what I'm working on. I'm looking forward to sharing it with you. And if you have enjoyed what we're doing here, you can help us by becoming a Patreon supporter and contributing $5 or more a month. By doing so, you help us to find the time and resources we need to produce the show. If you haven't already, please visit patreon.com forward slash the candid frame and become a Patreon supporter today. 
You can also support the show by writing a review wherever you listen to podcasts. And even better, if you really enjoy an episode, spread the word via an email to a friend, a post on your social network, or old school word of mouth. All of it's important and invaluable. So thank you for your support and being a part of the TCF family. I think one of the myths that exists for any art, but especially photographers, is that is the idea that at some point it becomes easier, <laughs> right? That oh, oh, okay, I'll get I'll get to a certain skill set, and then I'll be able to produce photographs that are as good as whatever photographer you emulate, and it'll become easier. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about that because I think that's sort of in line with it. Because there are going to be moments where where the work <laughs> is kicking your ass. Yeah, most of this year, my work kicked my ass, and that's, that's a number of months. Well, talk to me. <laughs> talk to me specifically about this year and how and how you experienced that. Wow. So I'm in my new house, trying to figure out in my new location, in my new state, trying to figure out the rules, trying to figure out what to do next. I still do voiceovers professionally, just because why not? I never like to just do one thing because I find that one thing, if I do multiple things, they're informing each other all mm-hmm. the time. Yeah. And if you just do one thing over and over again, you can, you know, the box gets smaller and smaller and pretty soon you can't see anything but the inside of that little tiny box you're in. So I like doing voiceovers. I don't want to do it full time. It's too inhibiting. But I do like doing them and I like expressing through my voice. So I had this huge job. It took four weeks. No, it took, um, basically it took, I think, January through April to do like 50, 50 finished hours of work, which is, you know, quite a bit more of that in recording and editing. Yeah. It was for, it, it was a big one and I couldn't go anywhere. So that made me crazy because I stay sane by going places. I mean, I stay sane wherever I go, but I prefer going places and so this job was highly technical. The language, there was nothing about it that was easy because the, even the language was challenging and they wanted it word for word. It couldn't, nothing could be wrong. You know, even the ifs, ands, and buts had wow. to be perfect. And it had to sound like I was an expert in that field and it had to sound conversational when it was anything but. So it was, you know, it was a, it was a big job. At the same time, I had seven brand new presentations to do this year for photography events. And I'm sure you've done made presentations and, you know, so you got to conceive of it and then you got to decide what the thought flow should be. And if they're similar, how are they different? And then you've got all the images and all Mm -hmm. the slides to make. And I had seven of them. So I had, that was the first part of my year was coming up with generating brand new material, a lot of it, and then doing this voiceover in this new home and, not being able to leave and the pressure just felt, I was just like, I hate my life. (laughs) (laughs) And I didn't mind anything I was doing. I just, I just hadn't had a minute, you know, to breathe and catch my breath. So, but I knew that this job, this voiceover job was going to feel like a real accomplishment. There's a, an adventure climbing, an adventure hiking, an adventure, adventuring. There's the thing where, you push yourself past the point you think you can do something like it's a harder climb or right. a longer hike and you think you can't do it. And then you get to the other side and the, you know, the choir of angel feeling <laughs> that you get at the end, it, it's like, it elevates you. It takes you a whole new place and it shifts you. I call it awe. It's a, like a moment of awe. And I knew that I just had to slog until it was done because I knew what, what I would have at the other end was some freedom and that I knew that for the events that were coming up, all my work was done. I would have done the work. I would have freedom to show up and really enjoy it and see whether I truly enjoyed it and wanted to repeat it and so on and so forth. And this was the work that had to be done. So it was just an awful lot and had a lot of requests for a lot of different things, plus photography. And I didn't take photos the whole time. I had just had that experience. I was commissioned to do some fine artwork, some conceptual work, mm-hmm. completely off of my radar. I had never done anything like this before. It involved working in a studio with strobes, with a model, and 
all this stuff. And I, you know, pitched the idea. They said yes. And I had a very short time to turn it around. And at, at various points, it looks like it was all going to fall apart. I had three models scheduled. They all canceled on me the day before. Oh. Uh, so I had to reschedule for the week, the next week, which gave me a l- even less time to, because mm-hmm. I had to do a lot of post-processing on these images. And uh, last week, uh, I got to stand uh, in front of these 30 by 70 prints <gasps> up in the wall. And one of the people there, one of the board members said she saw the work and it brought her to tears. And, and it was just like, just what you described. Um, it was yeah. a, a challenge. At one point, I felt like I was going to have to tell people I-, I can't do it. And the only thing I I knew to do was just like, what's the next indicated step? What's the next thing that you have to do? And it was like, okay, reschedule, put in more phone calls, call in more favors, and just keep and just trust that somehow it's all going to work out. Because that moment when when the models canceled on me, I felt like it's not going to come off. And, And instead, I just went, no, I still have time. Let me just trust and it was such, and I think that moment for me was the most important moment of that entire process. Yep, that's not, the one that changed it. Yeah, I mean, it just changed everything for me. Yeah. You know, because as, as much as I love how the photographs looked, how the prints looked, the reaction to them, that for me was was the key of being conscious of that moment where I had a decision to make, where I, I either could have retreated or I could have just pressed on, even though I didn't know how the hell it was all going to come together. You're much calmer than I am. I tend to throw things and swear a lot. In oh, I just, I just look Did calm. You? I just look <laughs> calm. <laughs> Only my wife sees me when I'm going, oh, crap. Yeah, uh, yeah my, my, my language when this mic is off can be quite colorful. Mm-hmm. Oh, me too. Oh, it's really horrifying. Yeah, but, but I think I, I. But I think not enough people put themselves in situations where they can experience that because it can be so scary. But oh, it, it makes is, you doubt everything. But that's important. You have to doubt everything because mm-hmm. that's that's how you where you you get to separate the stuff that doesn't work and you discover right. the stuff that really works. Otherwise, right. you're just guessing. Or you're just thinking, what, well, if this happens, then maybe I'll do this and maybe I'll do that. But you really don't know until you put into those circumstances. Right. And then as an artist and as a creative, and I think the people who are successful over the long term, whose work goes through several iterations, they know that. You know? yeah. And that's why their work evolves over time. It's not just that they're, they're reproducing the same stuff over and over and over again, just because they know it's successful. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes, too, people resist or, or avoid the situations that make them feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, and, like, I, I, wanna, I don't want to say I enjoy suffering because I don't. But when things come along that make me feel, I don't know, whatever it is, you know, whether it's doubting myself, which is always, <laughs> that's always my first place. Oh, my God, it's me, which is stupid and grandiose and egotistical. But... You, you feel like you doubt yourself. I'm like, I don't know. And so, but when I start feeling crappy, I don't want to say, I want to say I welcome it. Not because I like to feel that way, but mm-hmm. because I know, okay, I'm in a growth spurt here. And if I can sit with this and I can breathe through this and I can get what it is, like I'm facing a couple things right now where I'm like, you know, I just want to quit at, I don't know how to do that. And I'm yeah. like, really, really, really? That's the best you got? Come mm-hmm. on. <laughs> so I kind of welcome the issue part because I know that that's doing that's part of doing the work. And that is the part of doing the work that is my own personal breakthrough that's going to allow everything else to happen that I want. And if I'm not willing to go through that, then I can't, you know, fine, you don't have to. You won't get to have all that that juice at the other end. I've done both. Yeah. And I much prefer the reality selection that happens after going through that than staying comfortable all the time. So, so what, are you, what are the things that you do? Because I think that part of it, that in order to be able to sustain that sort of mindset, there's so many things that you have to do when you're not being creative. What, what's part of your self-care? Is it exercise? Is it meditation? Is it prayer? Is it reading? What, what are all the things that you use in order to, to help you? 
So I have a really strong spiritual base, not religious per se, but I know where I came from. And, you know, I grew up talking to God directly. So I'm, you know, the, the veil was very thin when I was young. So I, I know what home is. <laughs> and as long as I keep those channels open, things are good. So in order to do that, you know, I always make the joke, my mind wants to kill me. And so, <laughs> and it would if I let it. And so, I have to, My part of my discipline is the way I think, my thoughts. You know, those things all happen to us from conditioning and, you know, belief and all that kind of thing. So, we all have our, our own little interesting backgrounds. So, I know my source, but I still have, I'll, you know, I'll, I now recognize the thoughts that start to happen that are not constructive. And I know they're not me. And yeah. I know they're not mine. And I have to work with that. I started to talk about the beginning of the year and the funk that I was in, but related to this, what we're talking about, I've done a lot of personal development work. I mean, a lot. Years and years and years and years of personal growth work with in groups with teachers on my own reading. I have tools. Most people haven't even thought of, you know, that even exist. So, when I hit this funk and I found myself thinking this stream of really unconstructive thoughts <laughs> that were not positive and, you know, just making me feel like crap all the time, I went, okay, this has got to stop. How are we going to do that? And I'm like, come on, Karen, you know, this funk has gone on long enough. Grief. Okay, mm -hmm. I get it. But now you're kind of bathing in it. <laughs> <laughs> now you're kind of wearing it like a fragrance mm -hmm. and it don't smell that good. You know what I'm saying? So I was like, okay, we need to move what are we going to do? So I talked to myself like this. And the uh, part that I was talking to was like, well, we need to think better thoughts. Okay, how do you want to do that? What do you want to do? Do we need to get back into counseling? Do we need to go back and go through these lessons again? And I got really mad. I was the, the part of me was like, I don't want to F and do any of that. I've done it. I have done it to the point I want to barf. And, and we're still sitting here. And I'm like, okay, fair enough. Then next evolution what is the one thing you could think about every day because you know shift and change comes from little things you do every day what's the one thing you could think about that would shift everything like what's the one stop shop out of the whole thing and i had to think about it for a little while and, and i came up with awe awe mm. because awe is a completely transformational state they're calling it now the the 11th emotion there's a lot of research around it now and what it does for your entire personal, spiritual, soul, physical, you know, mental, everything is it really is a one stop shop. So I was like, OK, fair enough. You know, like the, the recalcitrant part of me went, OK, I'll play. And so we started and we had a moment, the two of us, where we said, OK, so you know what this means? And we were like, yeah, everything's going to turn to shit here for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you laugh because you know the minute you decide to take this elevator thing, the next thing that happens oh is the bottom God. falls out. And every yeah. thing that you ever, every reason why you're not already there, all surfaces. Mm -hmm. That is just, that's the key to, oh, you want to know why you're not thinking good thoughts all the time? Here you go. And it gets, it sucks for a while. And it did for quite a while. But yeah. I, every day I was just like, hello, ah. Hello. I know we're in a process here. Just hello, hello, hello. All I did was say hello to it for the longest time. And what ended up happening, I say it was a defining year, and it was, but I was able to go through everything I did and everything that happened from a perspective of it's all about awe, and not that I can make it happen, but looked at from that perspective, mm -hmm. I was able to make decisions about what I want to do next. And what I arrived at is probably the thing that scares me the most that I've heard them, I have the most conditioning about, oh, that can't work because nobody makes a living at that. And I've just, I just sort of, it's like trap shooting anymore, yeah. you know, pull and then you can't do it because, you know, nobody makes a living at that. You blow that one, that little puppy out of the air. You go next. <laughs> so you just blow all these bad thoughts out of there and all these reasons why. And I don't know exactly how it's all going to happen. And I have to trust that my divine guidance and, you know, that part of what I'm connected to that mm -hmm. has always guided my life will step in. It feels right. It just, it lines up with every part of my being. And I couldn't have gotten there if I didn't use awe as the measure, 
And so I called it my year of awe, and I actually started a group on Flickr and then immediately went into such a funk. <laughs> mm. I haven't hardly been back. I set it all up, and it's it's a really cool you know place to go and watch some videos and learn some things and get exposed to some different ways of thinking. But I had to go into my process this year, which was really hard. Mm. But now I'm emerging with a new thing. But it didn't take a week. It's yeah. taken months. I'm glad you shared that. And this is what I take away from that, is that I have no doubt that you're going to be able to succeed in, in what you're doing because you have a track record of going through that experience with all these other things, right? Mm-hmm. In terms of mm-hmm. starting something where you don't know how, you know, you don't know the basics, you learn the basics, you go through the whole ups and downs of being creative you get to the point where you get skilled enough in which you're free to be able to express yourself you did it in photography you did it with voiceover you did it with ice skating you've done it in so many things so you you've walked through the process yep through all the doubts so even though you're going to encounter some new things that are unfamiliar you're going to fall on your face at times you're going to make mistakes some of which are going to cost you nothing which which may cost you something Yep. <laughs> you 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 recognize the experience, yeah. and I think people who try to do something different, who don't have that track record, are the same people who will tell you, "I tried it; it didn't work. Save yourself the grief." Right. Right. But because you have sort of made that part of your life, it increases the chances of you being able to su- succeed. Because if you read biographies of people who are like multimillionaires who are incredible successful, they've had a track record of failed businesses behind them. Yeah. You know, it isn't just that they went out for that first that first thing and then they all of a sudden succeeded. They mm-hmm. knew that that was part of the game. Right. And when you do, that's when it's so liberating and you're so free and you can and you can well, do amazing yeah, things. You can, but you know what people a lot of times don't realize yeah. is that when you're in the thick of it, you know, they they'll say to you, "Oh, well, you always knew it was going to be successful, you know, even oh. in the thick of it." And I'm like, "Oh, no. No. Uh-uh. <laughs> no you don't. I don't. Yeah. I just But the the thing is, but you mentioned earlier when we were chatting about this bone infection that almost killed me in whatever 2006, uh, when I hit those places of you know, like, I feel like I'm not going to succeed. I look at that. I look at that almost near death experience. <laughs> I just mm. go, you know what? I don't want to look back. Cause I had a moment where I thought I was looking back on my life and this was it. I'm like, I don't want to look back and go, yeah, that was a nice life. You kind of chickened out, but mm. it was okay. I'm like, I don't want to go out like that. Yeah. I, I want to go out, you know, or transition or whatever. I don't know, whatever it is that happens. I want to feel at the end of the day, at the end of every day, like I gave it my all. I didn't chicken out. I went for what I loved. And, I, and I'm, I'm sitting right now at a point in my photography where I'm going to take a step in the direction I've always wanted that I have always talked myself out of, always. Mm-hmm. So am I comfortable? No. I've tried everything else because I do try things. I try lots of things and I kind of empirically prove to myself, you should do it this way, not that way, because you've tried it every other way and you know yeah. how that all turns out. <laughs> so what's left is this and it's very naked and it feels just as exposed as, you know, when I watched Ekaterina Gordieva skate that mm-hmm. first program for her husband, I feel like it's all on the line and I'm going to do it anyway. I got two words for you, and, I, and I'm, I'm taking them from the comedian Tiffany Haddish. Do you know her? I don't. She was in Girls Girls Trip with. Uh, okay. But she has these two lines. She ready. She ready. <laughs> Is she ready? <laughs> That's you. She ready. <laughs> she ready. <laughs> I look um, forward. I look forward to seeing that 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 part of your life and career. I, okay. I'm very excited for you. Not not because I'm looking at the 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 end result. But I'm I'm look so looking forward to talking to you when you when you've gotten there and you get to tell me what the experience was was of getting there. Oh my God! Will I know when I'm there? That's that's always the, one of the questions. How will I know when I'm there? <laughs> You'll be worrying about different things. Yeah, I suppose, <laughs> I suppose you're right. Oh, that's well, funny. my last question, which I ask each guest, is I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore on their own, and it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who are that one oh photographer God. and why? 
He's been around forever, but my recent discovery that I'm obsessed with is David Brookover. Oh, I don't know him. Oh, yeah. He's he's doing kind of what I started. It's He's doing a combination of what I started out in this photography world in, in my 20s thinking I would do, but mm-hmm. then wasn't able to because of darkroom chemicals and this and that. And what I love most about what I do now, and I, I haven't met him yet. I went to his gallery. I met his, his gal, you know, that works in the gallery. His work brought me to tears. Wow. And it was incredible. He has a gallery in Jackson Hole. David Brookover, um, he shoots, you know, a full, what do you call it, full frame, you know, 8 by 10 Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And as well as when he shoots digital, he shoots Fujifilm. He Because he, uh, I'm a Fujifilm ex-photographer, and I love my Fujifilm cameras. And... And he worked with Fujifilm Japan when he lived in Japan. And so he shoots Fujifilm digital. So there's these common things. But I see his work and I see myself in it and I see where I want to go. He's totally, totally fired me up and inspired me. And I will meet him soon. But his work is phenomenal. Well, thank you for that. I look forward to checking out his work. And and you are always a pleasure and a joy. And I'm glad to... Have you in my life, even if it's virtually most of the time. Aw, I love that. And I love having you in mind, too. And I hope I hope someday I think I'm going to put in my wish bag of what reality selections I want next is to see you in person more often. Yeah. Because I, I love our conversations and I love the work you do in the world. So thank you for having me on the show. Thanks to Karen for sitting down with us again. Find out more about her and her work by visiting KarenHutton.com. I also have two upcoming workshops, the first in Los Angeles in November at the Los Angeles Center of Photography and in Tokyo, Japan in December. You can find out more about my event in Japan by visiting NobechiCreatives.com and LACP.org for my workshop here in Los Angeles in November. Also, check out my YouTube channel where I offer comments on photography submitted by TCF listeners who contribute to the Candid Frame Flickr Pool. Check out the TCF Flickr Pool and our YouTube channel by clicking on the link in the show notes and the website. My most recent book, Making Photographs, Developing a Personal Visual Workflow, is now available. You can purchase it today and receive 40% off the list price when you order it from the Rocky Nook website. Use the promo code PARELLO40 at checkout to take advantage of the discount. And receive three free copies of my previously published ebooks by signing up for the Candid Frame mailing list, where I share thoughts about life, photography, and keep you updated on TCF events. Not all episodes may be available on your podcast or app of choice. So to download, listen, and share any and all episodes of The Candid Frame, download the TCF app for Apple iOS and Android. And because of your support, it's free. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at the other martintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And this is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame.